Welcome to the Hooked with TMO Fishing Podcast. I am Tim Moore. I am a professional fishing guide and outdoor promotions monkey from New Hampshire. This is the very first episode of the Hooked with TMO Fishing Podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in. Really happy to be here. This podcast is about fishing, recovery, and maybe do a little bit of ranting. You never know what's going to come up. But the main focus of this podcast is to talk about some of my adventures and talk with some of my friends in the fishing industry and also uh, maybe a little bit about you know my recovery from alcoholism. So I thought being the very first episode, there are probably going to be questions. I figured I ought to just kind of tell my story, my, uh, my story about alcoholism and my background and how I ended up working uh, as a full-time fishing guide in the fishing industry. I do also do a lot of seminars and, and I'm a freelance writer and I do a lot of work for a lot of my sponsors, pro staff positions across the country. So without further ado, let's get, let's get right at it. I am originally from a town in New Hampshire called Portsmouth. It's a historic uh, waterfront town on the, on right on Portsmouth Harbor. And it's a uh, very historic. My family is from an area of Portsmouth called uh, Puddle Dock, which is probably the, like the beginnings of Portsmouth, what the original um, town of Portsmouth was a fishing uh, and ship builders or boat builder, uh, a lot of industry in that. We have the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard here. So the, the Portsmouth Harbor, which is the harbor to the Piscataqua River, which forms the beginning of the border between New Hampshire and Maine, was heavily defended during World War II. So there's a lot of history here. But fishing is something that has always been in my family. Uh, I'm fifth generation. Uh, and the um, original family members on my grandmother's side came here from the Azores, Portuguese islands. So we have a Portuguese background. Uh, whether you believe it or not, I do. Uh, um, so I fished, I have fished my whole life. It's, it's, I don't ever remember not fishing my, um, the family wharf has been in my family for five generations. My cousin Jason and his family live there now, but my grandmother's sister lived there when I was a kid growing up and with her husband, they raised their family there and we would go there on weekends. Um, so to, back up just a little bit. My, I was raised by my grandmother from the time I was six on, uh, both my parents, uh, were alcoholics. My father's passed away. He was about 20 years sober when he died, but he was an alcoholic, uh, growing up active alcoholic as a, as a kid. And so, uh, my grandmother took me to live temporarily when I was six and I moved out when I got my first apartment when I was 19. So it was a, a very long temporary move but she would bring me on the weekends down to the family wharf and that was really where I got a lot of my introduction to fishing as all my cousins would be out um, swimming off the float swimming out to the lot my uncle's lobster boat on the mooring in the in the back channel and you know looking for sea glass and swimming around down on the little rocky beach next to the house and and most of the time I could be found on the float with a fishing rod in my hand catching flounder and whatever else, Pollock and little, um, sculpin, we call them gropies, um, whatever I could catch. I just loved, I, I loved fishing. I loved being around it. My uncle Wiley was a lobsterman by trade. That's, that's what he did. He, he caught and sold his own lobsters and rock crabs and had a bait shop there. And it was a bustling business. When I was a kid, there was a public boat launch right across the back channel from there. And the boaters would launch their boats to go fishing and they'd come over and they'd get bait from uncle Wiley and then they'd head out and they'd do their fishing for whatever they were, whatever they were going for. Uh, so that was my introduction to fishing. My dad was always a big part of my life. Even though I did not live with him, he was always around. And if I wasn't in, down at the wharf in the summertime with my grandmother, I was with him fishing. And, and that's just what we did all the time. I wasn't old enough to hunt with him yet. So as a small child, we just fished and, and we'd horn pout and flounder fishing and eventually striper fishing and um, trout fishing. Anything that he could eat, we would go and fish for regularly. The difference with him was he was an, a heavy drinker. He drank everything revolved around alcohol. And so fishing um, was consisted of, you know, sitting on a bank drinking or 
going north to Pittsburgh, New Hampshire and riding logging roads, which were mostly deserted and come to a, a stream, we'd stop and we'd fish it. And, and he was drinking the whole time. And um, that was, you know, so drinking and fishing always went together and he always managed to make it look like he was having a good time. When I was with my dad, we always did fun things and he was always drinking and always seemed like alcohol made those fun things even more fun for him. And I just kind of latched onto that at a young age. Like that was the, the piece that was missing for me because I was a kid and I wasn't old enough to drink, but I knew when I became old enough to drink that that piece would that missing piece would eventually be filled in there. And, and that piece that was missing from my experience would, would, uh, would get, you know, place and put into place. And so having some allergies, so excuse my, my runny nose or stuffy nose. Um, so that was, you know, that was life. Um, that was kind of my introduction to alcohol. My mom was, was an alcoholic and she wasn't around a whole lot, which led to me uh, going to live with my grandmother, but my dad would take me and we'd, we'd go on all these fun adventures in the wintertime. We'd go smelt fishing on great Bay. And that was a party. I mean, that was just a big party. That's, it was, you know, smelt drinking or ice drinking. Um, it was more about the drinking than the fishing. So I, I romanticized alcohol from a young age. And, you know, I would sneak sips of alcohol from my dad's beers. And if we'd be riding the dirt roads and he'd ask me to get one out of the cooler, I'd open it and take a sip. And uh, eventually, you know, I started finding ways to get alcohol. Uh, friends would steal it from their parents and, you know, and we'd get drunk whenever we could, and which wasn't all that often. But that progressed. And, you know, eventually, you know, I started finding ways to get alcohol, people that would buy it for me whatever. And, you know, it was all fun and games, but I think my, my favorite thing about alcohol was that, you know, I was a, a scrawny kind of goofy dorky kid growing up and I was picked on a lot in, you know, all through school, uh, picked on and made fun of. And I, I was, you know, just a super skinny, lanky kid. So I, I, I couldn't fight my way out of it. I wasn't, you know, a, a tough kid or a fighter or anything like that. So I was always looking for a way to fit in. And I started to notice that when I drank, I didn't care. You know, when I was sober, I felt ugly, small, and stupid. Would get a couple of beers into me and get a little bit of a buzz. And I felt 10 feet tall, bulletproof, invincible, and really didn't care if I wasn't. And that was the, that was a freedom for me. That, that is something that I had never felt in my life. Even as a small child, I was always just kind of full of fear and felt different than everybody else. Like I didn't really fit in. So alcohol either made me fit in. And when it didn't make me fit in, it made me not care that I didn't fit in. So I loved it right away. I knew, I knew before I drank, it was going to be awesome. I knew after I drank that it was awesome. And I chased that freedom that alcohol brought me. Like, I don't, the only other thing I've chased at that hard is, um, recovery <laughs> ironically and my work in the fishing industry. Um, but I started to notice as I became, you know, a teenager, older teenager, 16, 17 years old, you know, I, I eventually, I, I got into a lot of legal trouble. I dropped out of high school. And when I dropped out of high school, that's when the shit really hit the fan. Uh, things really went downhill. That was kind of my, I had given myself permission to drink as much as I wanted whenever I wanted and not be responsible or accountable to anyone or anything, no job, no people, girlfriends didn't matter. I wasn't responsible to anyone. I did whatever I wanted. And, and booze was the catalyst that, that allowed me to do that because I saw people my entire life that seemed to behave badly with impunity. Like they just kept doing it over and over and over again. And I thought that they were getting away with it. Little did I know nobody was really getting away with anything. But um, so by the time I was 18, I was drinking so much that uh, I couldn't open a beer can in the morning. My hands shook too bad when I woke up and I had a really good habit of, of getting a beer can open the night before uh, before I passed out and kind of stashing it somewhere where I couldn't knock it over. So it would be open in the morning. Cause that's the only thing that would get rid of those shakes. 
And I wasn't really concerned about it. I thought it just kind of came with the territory. You know, I had brought my dad to detox several times and seen him in some pretty rough shape, but I never really um, associated, you know, a lot of those things. It would, they just came with the territory and, and what I was getting from it was so much better, so much outweighed, you know, those rough mornings. And, um, but my behavior started to get worse. And, uh, I started to do things to people that they didn't deserve and behave in ways towards people that they really didn't, nobody deserve, deserve, you know, cheating on girlfriends and, um, stealing money. You know, I was the guy that would steal your wallet and help you look for it, you know, while I was in my pocket. Uh, I had just become this person that I really didn't like. And it was funny because I started out as a person that I didn't like. I found alcohol. I became somebody I thought I liked. And then eventually I came, became somebody that I did not like. And I did really, 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 really bad things to really, really good people. And I just didn't treat anybody with respect and the loyalty. I had very little loyalty. There were a couple of friends that I had, um, Gabe and Eddie, they were pretty much the only ones I was really loyal to. Uh, my lifelong friend, Nathan, him and I, you know, always have and always will be friends. So he's kind of in a category of his own. We've we've kind of been through ups and downs and rough patches and we're more like brothers and friends. So, um, but I didn't hang out with him a whole lot then because he kind of had his shit together and and I didn't. And and it just was uncomfortable to be around people that, that made good decisions um, that were responsible. And so... I didn't see as much of him um, in my later teen years. But by the time I was 19, I had been arrested for a couple of felonies. I was out of jail on bail. I was drinking every single day, every all day if I could. And I was really in rough shape. I weighed 112 pounds. Um, and I, I was a, a mess in all regards. And uh, I got sober. Um, through a bail violation, I ended up going to jail and then I went to detox and rehab and, and, um, eventually, you know, through rehab, you know, in, through the detox process in jail, I detoxed in jail for, I spent three days, um, sweating and shivering and hallucinating in a jail cell in the County jail and, um, sobering up. And, and then I got out and get into detox and the woman that ran the detox I went to, I knew her from bringing my father there over the years. And she said, you know, she called me in jail and said, you know, we're going to have you come here and, and get you started on some, some kind of a program. And she said, I just want to let you know that and remind you that the way you drink, it's, it's probably sounds great. Like drink yourself to death, but that doesn't really happen that often. And what normally happens is you'll end up having to get sober again. You'll get arrested again and you'll have to get sober again, which means another three days of, or four days of what you just went through all over again. And, and that was a, a real eye opener for me. That was kind of like reality. Like, yeah, she's right. You know, she's, she's definitely right. I'm, I'm probably going to have to get sober again. I watched my dad do this several times and I can't imagine going through this again. I don't know how he did it as many times as he did and still went right back out drinking today. I do, I'm, you know, I'm an alcoholic and, and that's just comes with the territory. You don't, you know, there comes a, a point for any active alcoholic where they don't have a, a choice. You know, the last night that I drank, I had been three months sober for about the fifth time. And, uh, but it was the first three months that I had ever gone without thinking about alcohol. I just hadn't really given it any thought. I was pretty sick and tired of, of, uh, of living that lifestyle. And I wanted something better, but I was pretty afraid of, of AA, which is what I had been exposed to at the time. And, I was sitting home alone one night and this, this kid that I went to high school with, we were best friends all through high school, showed up at my house. He'd never been there. I don't even know how, I never thought to ask him how he found me, but he knocked on the door and when I opened the door, he was standing there with a suitcase of Budweiser in one hand and he let a bag of weed unroll in the other. And I stepped aside and he walked through my living room, through my kitchen and down into my basement. Like he'd been there before. He'd never been in this house. I had only lived there for a few months. And we hung out down there all night long, drinking and smoking. And about three hours in, it hit me. Like I, it was like I had forgot that I was sober and I drank without even thinking about it. And then I remembered like, oh my God, you're, you were sober. You just threw away three months and it was so insidious and, and just sick and twisted. Like it was literally like, 
like forgetting your kid at the daycare. Like, how could you do that? How did you manage to forget that? And I spent the next several hours sitting there drinking, but thinking in my head, silently thinking, what are you going to do now? Um, I had, I had been to enough AA meetings that, that I had heard some passages read and things that were said. And, and, um, the, I remember this one, one passage that I had heard that a lot of people would say, and, and that is that there will come a time where no mental defense, you'll have no mental defense against the first drink, meaning you won't be able to think your way out of it. And I never really understood what that meant other than, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I didn't identify with, I didn't, I didn't get it. Well, that night I got it. No mental defense, meaning you'll drink without even, without giving yourself permission. You'll just do it even when you're sober because you can't think your way out of it. And I thought, well, that was my last hope. Uh, what am I going to do now? Uh, I did go, I did go back to AA, but I didn't, I just didn't like it. Um, I don't have anything bad to say about it today, but I did not like it then. You know, I would sit in meetings and there were these bars in Portsmouth at the time, these just dive bars, the Ranger Club, the Starlight Club, um, Rico's, which eventually became Wally, the old bridge. And I would hear these people talk about, you know, like the Starlight Club was probably the worst bar in Portsmouth when I was a kid. It was the kind of place you wipe your feet on the way out. It was just a nasty, you could see, you had to walk down this alley between in this between these buildings and then go down these stairs and the door was at the bottom of the store stairs and you walk down that alley and you could smell the bar before you even got to the stairs it was just gross and i'd hear people in meetings say you know at the end of my drinking you know i started out drinking in the hotel bars and at the end of my drinking i was at the starlight that's where that's where booze brought me it brought me to the starlight club i remember sitting there thinking have you looked around because you're in an aa meeting I'd rather be at the Starlight Club because this place is horrible. That's really how I felt about Alcoholics Anonymous. I did not like it because I didn't I didn't understand what people were talking about. I didn't know. I didn't understand how it worked. Uh, and I was afraid of the people there. I would hear things like, look around because everybody here is just like you. And I think they're going to steal my wallet, too. And I just didn't I didn't trust it. I didn't understand it. And I was uncomfortable there and people were talking about their feelings and being honest about themselves. And I just wasn't there. I didn't want to do that. So I did go back to AA after that last night of drinking. I kind of hung around for about a year doing really nothing, just showing up and sitting in the back and, you know, showing up late and leaving early. And um, one of the meetings that I went to regularly, one of the guys was like, you must be coming up on a year. We'll have a cake for you when you come next week. And I was like, no, 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 I'm not doing that. So I just didn't go back for about a year. Uh, and in that year, they call that couch AA. I didn't drink, but I fell into a really, really bad depression and could barely get off the couch. I had a, a decent job working for a residential custom home builder and he was an amazing boss, put up with a ton. I mean, I went for a long time without working a full week, but I worked so hard when I was there that he didn't want to get rid of me. And he, you know, he, he saw something in me and he just hung in there. And so I had that, but I didn't have anything else. And, um, I had met a woman in rehab. We, we got together and, and, uh, we had a baby, my daughter, um, <clears throat> and she was, you know, young, she was an infant at the time. And I remember, you know, being so depressed, I couldn't even go to the dump and, um, didn't feel like she really knew who I was. And, um, I, I anyways, I kind of had a, a breakdown and, and I decided instead of going to AA, I was going to call a therapist. So I did, I made an appointment with a therapist and that woman, I've heard this said before in AA, she picked out a landing zone in my chest and landed on it with both feet. I was in there about 15 minutes and she said, so how come you haven't gone to an AA meeting and you're here first? And she just knew she just nailed me. She could see through my bullshit and she nailed me on it. And she said, you know, I think you're depressed and you definitely need some medication to get you by until we can deal with, you know, the, your lifestyle, which is causing you to be depressed and deal with some of the issues that you have that are causing your depression. But I really think you need to go to AA because you're, you are an alcoholic and, and they're much better at treating that than I am. So I did, I went back to AA and I spent many, many years in AA, you know, I got a sponsor and I did all the work that they suggest and, and lo and behold, my life started to change. You know, it was no coincidence. They, uh, they knew what they were talking about, and, but it needed to be broken down enough 
that I was willing to do what they said because I had all these wants and, oh, I don't want to do that. And I don't, I'm uncomfortable with that. Well, you know what? You're an alcoholic. There are going to be some uncomfortable things that you're going to have to do to get yourself out of this. So, you know, I bit the bullet and I, and I did it, even the things that I didn't like. And I, and I, I muddled through and I, and I did the best I could and, and I got better at it and I better and better. And and I started to kind of, you know, feel a little more normal again. You know, all I wanted when I went to AA was a guarantee that I wouldn't drink and my first sponsor, he opened up the book and he read me this passage that said, nothing will so much ensure immunity from drinking like intensive work with other alcoholics. He said, you're going to, that's the only way you're going to get a guarantee is if you just intensively work with other alcoholics. And so I did that. I dove into helping other people, sponsoring people, taking people to meetings. Um, you know, I was on the, um, the AA hotline for a long time. They would call, I'd get calls from people in the middle of the night or whenever, and um, the other thing I wanted was I, I heard something mentioned, talked about being neutral towards alcohol. And for some reason, I didn't know most of what they were talking about in AA, but that clicked with me. Like I understood that being neutral towards alcohol. I couldn't be around alcohol, couldn't be around it at all. I couldn't listen to anybody talk about it. I couldn't be around somebody that was drinking. I, I was not neutral. It either triggered me to want to drink or it made me super, super uncomfortable. Uh, and so that was my goal to stay sober and to become neutral towards alcohol so that I could go to an event where people were drinking and I wouldn't have to leave early because I was so uncomfortable that I didn't have to fight the urge to drink. And, you know, I, I learned later on that, that just comes with time, you know, time sober and time living a good sober life, making good decisions. Eventually, you, my life got so good that I stopped thinking about any, I stopped associating alcohol with any kind of benefit whatsoever. It does not, it brings no benefit to me whatsoever. Maybe some of it tastes good, but so does root beer and coffee, which I drink too much of both of. Um, you know, today I'm, I am neutral towards alcohol. And towards the end of my drinking, the last few years, I didn't, really didn't fish much at all, you know, maybe a handful of times in three or four years. And, but I missed it, you know, and, and when I, but when I got sober, I couldn't do it. I couldn't even think about fishing without drinking. I didn't think it was going to be possible. I just, I knew there was going to be too much temptation there. And it was, you know, it's like a, a, someone who quits smoking, smelling smoke the day after they quit. It's just too much. It's too much of a reminder. And so it took a while, you know, I was sober a couple of years before I really started to fish again. And I got to tell you, I, it did not take long when I was out, I started ice fishing and I, I, we connected with an old childhood friend and and we would ice fish on Lake Winnipesaukee a lot. And it took many, many fishing trips before I realized that at that point in my life, while I was fishing was the only time I didn't think about drinking for any, for more than 15 minutes. I could go, you know, minutes or everything reminded me of drinking. Everything made me want to, or reminded me of something that was in, that I did when I was drinking and except fishing after a while, I it, like that association was magically removed. And I don't know why or how, because everything else reminded me of drink and I couldn't even drive without thinking about it. But I, I realized that I would come off the ice and I would, and I would realize that I hadn't, I had been out there for four or five hours and I haven't thought about drinking once. And I would realize that because I would think about it as soon as I came off the ice and was like, wow, that was, I want to go back. That was such a relief. So I started to chase fishing the way that I chased alcohol to get me that, to get me that relief. You know, I was, I was able to stay sober and I was able to function and be productive, but I couldn't get those thoughts for any length of time out of my head. And I started stringing days of fishing together. And, you know, there are worse ways to spend a day and worse things to spend my money on. I know I did it, uh, but I got more active is in fishing and, started to hunt again. And, but fishing was really, really that thing that kind of saved me. And it was almost like when I was a kid, alcohol was the piece that was missing to complete the experience in life and sobriety. Fishing was the thing that was missing to complete that experience. So things had kind of come around full circle. And uh, I found a lot of peace fishing on the ice and, you know, 
from shore and in the boat, whatever. I didn't own a boat at the time, but I go out with my friends in their boats and I found a lot of, a lot of peace and solace and relief while I was fishing. And I just started to chase it more. And I had always kind of had this little dream of being a, a, a guide. I, you know, I grew up watching shows like Grizzly Adams and my dad loved Westerns, which was a lot of kind of wilderness stuff and call of the wild. And I just kind of romanticized being, uh, being, you know, in the wilderness and somehow that evolved into wanting to be a guide and, and, uh, it just was one of those things I didn't really think would happen. It would be awesome if it could, but I didn't think it would be something that would happen for me. So I didn't pay a lot of attention to it, but in, in sobriety and, and in my time invested into fishing and hunting, my friends started to tell me, you need to get a guide's license. You need to get paid to do this. In New Hampshire, we have to have a license. It's a pretty strict process to get it. It's pretty tough. Um, it wasn't quite as tough when I first started, but uh, my friends would say, you know, you should be getting paid for this. You take everybody hunting. You're like everybody's guide. You know, why don't you get paid for this? So uh, finally in, in 2006, I got a, I got a guide's license and all of my friends that would told me that I should get a guide's license. I was like, so you're going to book a trip. And they're like, well, we're not going to pay you to go hunting and fishing with you. You've been doing it for free all these years. We're not going to pay you. Go find some clients. And uh, that was the beginning of it. You know, I, and I struggled through my first year as a guy trying to book trips and not really knowing what the hell I was doing and not being able to really get anything going. And at the end of that year, I, I kept track of all my time in my first year. And at the end of that year, I, I did the math with how much I had made and I averaged two cents an hour. And I kind of gave up on the dream of being a full-time guide. And I just thought, eh, I'll do it whenever I can. If somebody wants to book a trip, maybe it'll pay for a new fishing rod or a new gun or for hunting or something, some new cool you know, tree stand or something like that. Maybe it'll you know help my hobby pay for itself. And uh, in the background, things just kind of started growing little by little. Every year I got a little bit busier. Every ice fishing season would come around and I'd get a little busier ice fishing. Eventually I got away from guiding hunters and more involved in fishing. And um, I got involved, heavily involved in kayak fishing um, through uh, process. Really, I wanted to take people out in a canoe and realized I couldn't do that without a captain's license. Didn't have the means to get a captain's license at the time, but kayaks, you know, as long as my clients are controlling their own vessel, I can legally guide them in them which is not as easy as it sounds. <laughs> Trust me, kayak, guiding kayak anglers is one of the more difficult guiding that I do. Um, there's just a lot more to it that you don't think about. It's not really as easy. But I got heavily involved in kayak fishing. And before that, you know, I, I was guiding a lot of, I, my main focus was ice fishing. And I started to become aware of this style of fishing from the Midwest. And I started to notice, you know, companies like Clam Outdoors and Vexilar and how those, their products were being used in this new style of more mobile, more active fishing. And I started to hear people talk about catching more fish in the middle of the day, which, you know, I grew up think, hearing from my dad, like the fish just don't bite. Like we wouldn't even fish in the middle of the day. We would leave and come back if we were going to fish all day, but never in the middle of the day, almost never. And because the fish just didn't bite. And I started to learn more of these techniques to catch more fish and started to pay more attention to it. And then I started to notice guides and, and things from the Midwest that were sponsored and, you know, were on these pro staffs and they were getting, you know, deep discounts on product in, in exchange for their promotional value. And I started reaching out to companies and um, I, you know, I know a lot of writers and a lot of published writers and, and, you know, rejections are, are, par for the course in the writing industry when it comes to writing a book. And, uh, it is in the pro staff industry too. You know, I, I was, I was a nobody really. I'm in the industry. Nobody knew who I was. And it wasn't until I was given some opportunities, you know, I met my good friend, Mark Beauchene from New Hampshire fishing game. He started giving me some opportunities to kind of get my name out there and, and, uh, I was on their, on their show a few times. They had a television show, which is now just on YouTube, but I've been on their show a bunch of times. Dave Gens uh, is a big name in the ice fishing industry from Minnesota. He works with Clam and he would come out here to New Hampshire every year. And I was invited to fish with them one year. And that was my introduction to Dave. And I don't know if it's any coincidence, but the following winter I was on their pro staff 
uh, and I, you know, I do, I do believe, you know, I remember coming off the ice that day and Dave saying, you know, I was pretty impressed when we pulled in here and saw you out on the ice with all that clam outdoors gear. And, uh, the next year I was on their pro staff and I knew that I wanted to be affiliated with clam. They were, they were, they're a good company. They make, you know, the best ice, ice fishing products in the industry. They're probably the biggest ice fishing company in the industry. And I knew that I wanted to be associated with them. So, I started hounding them every year. I would email them and check in and it would be the wrong time of year or, or, you know, um, just didn't, you know, I, my pitch was wrong. You know, I didn't have, I didn't know what I was doing. I had no idea. There was nobody around me. I didn't know anybody that was doing it. And uh, when I started picking up sponsorships, you know, I got my first paid sponsorship. The people in my area were astounded that a non-tournament angler had actually achieved the level of, of getting a paid sponsorship because it just wasn't done back then. Uh, but I just wasn't taking no for an answer. I couldn't see any reason not to. I worked hard for these companies. I was willing to do whatever they needed me to do. Uh, I believed in their products. And that was the most important thing for me was that, you know, I went to the companies whose products I already used. I don't think I've ever accepted a sponsorship deal with a company that came to me. I went to them. Uh, maybe a couple and it just didn't work out. So I started to notice that being a guide helped me in the promotions end, end of things. And then being in a promotional end of things helped me as a guide. And those two things started to kind of pick each other up. You know, one would come up then it would elevate the next one. And then that would elevate the other side. And, and it was a definitely a, a very, um, clear relationship between my success as a guide and the opportunities that I had. Um, I was, I was naive and I didn't know anything about the industry. And I was always really, really honest about that. I've never been one that didn't like to admit what I don't know. It's easier to learn something I don't know than to pretend I know something I don't. Uh, so I've always been one to say, I don't know what this is, but teach me. And I'll, once I learn it, I'll, I'll be the best I can at it. And, and I think that, you know, trying to practice some level of humility with companies, but also showing um, an intense passion and dedication for their product really speaks to companies. And I know today that it does. I didn't know this at the time, but I know today that that really speaks to companies and they're looking for dedicated and passionate people is what they want. They don't want just the best fishermen. There are a lot of good fishermen and, and women out there, um, but they're not all good at the promotions end of things. And they're not all loyal. Some people jump ship a lot, which is frowned upon, you know, when you've been at four different, kayak companies and and then you go to another one and they're going to be like, eh, what makes us any different than anybody else? Why are you coming to us now? So I learned a lot, you know, and I've been, always been very observant and watching people in the industry. And, and it wasn't until about five years ago that I started to really incorporate my sobriety and my work in the fishing industry and kind of meld them together and use, you know, what, what, um, what awareness or, or what level of, of, um, I don't know, notoriety is the right word, um, that I had achieved to do something good, you know, for other recovering alcoholics. And the, the first opportunity I had was when Clam Outdoors sent, um, the across the ice belt crew out to New Hampshire to film, uh, an episode of across the ice belt and tell my story, talk a little bit about being sober and, uh, and, you know, to tell people that you can, you can do this. You can, you can get sober. You can stay sober. You can achieve something in that sobriety, you know, something great. you like your dreams, whatever those dreams are. And uh, that was my first opportunity to really use that. And, and I've taken other opportunities to kind of share my experience in the fishing or, and, or recovery um, fields and in hopes of helping somebody in the fishing industry or somebody in, in recovery. Um, I've been sober 28 years. My sobriety date is February 25th, 1993. And it's been an unbelievable ride. I never imagined I'd be where I am. I'm not rich. I'm not getting rich anytime soon, but I live a, I live a modest life. I, I work in the fishing industry full-time. I have some great, amazing relationships with companies. And through those amazing relationships, I have formed some of the closest friendships that I've ever known. Uh, it's been a, it's been a true gift, but for me, none of that was possible if I didn't stay sober.
that's that's just you know take it take it for what it is um so sobriety and and my work in the fishing industry are are you know a, very important to me but but one needs the other <laughs> uh call it a curse call it what you want but that's my story so there will be more revealed this podcast won't be all about recovery and we'll be all about fishing. It'll be both maybe one sided, you know, it'll lean one way or the other. I know a lot of, of people in the fishing industry or that fish who are also in recovery. And so there are a lot of stories to tell. And hopefully this, we can use this as a platform to talk about that, but I, I want to offer some, some, in, some uh, opportunities to learn some things. So hopefully I get some of my friends in the industry to come on here and share some of their knowledge in the fishing industry um, knowledge, uh, as anglers, fishing knowledge, tips and things like that. And, uh, see if we can't, you know, have a good time doing this. So I want to thank everybody for tuning in. If you're watching this on YouTube, please hit that subscribe button. We're going to try to get it out here on all the other, on other, um, platforms for our podcasts. I really appreciate you tuning in for all the information about me. Visit, visit us on the web at timmoreoutdoors.com. You can find information about guided trips there, book your trip through the website, look at my calendar, see some of the media that, that has been done on me, links to the podcasts and future episodes and things like that. So thank you all for tuning in. I really appreciate it. It's a good time. Let's have some fun with this and uh, stay tuned. I'm not sure what's coming up next, but I'm going to try to make it a fun one. Peace.